um, I have finished grading and I have posted the grade. What you see on Canvas is a post adjusted uh, score. Um, I think the third highest score of the class you know, scored a 3.25 out of four. So that became the new 4.0 for this class. So everybody is kind of bumped up you know, by you know, four divided by 3.25. You know, that's the ratio of the bump up. <clears throat> and I do not intend to do any further adjustment to the score. So what you see in exam one is the actual score. All right, so uh, we can talk about that later if there's any discussion you want to talk about. But right now we are going to continue with our topic to continue to talk about the processor. Um, we talked about the you know, execution cycles of a single instruction on last Thursday, okay? So I hope you guys had a chance to review the material and also to go through the process yourself at least once, okay? just so that you're getting more familiarized with the processor. Uh, not doing that, not practicing and going through that process to go through the execution cycle, starting with the fetch cycle and then the decode and then execute and then find out, finding out you know, how things are connected in the processor. That is going to be very important in exam two. So that means you know, what we are doing right now is we, I'm just trying to distribute the quote-unquote studying for exam two, kind of like spread it over, you know, time instead of you know having everybody to have to remember everything about the processor, you know, for exam two, you know, like try to cram everything in, that's not going to work. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what I'm doing or I, I'm trying to do for this class. So what we are going to do today is uh, in the lab we have a new lab called you you cannot see it yet, you know, you can see it's not uh, shown yet. But this lab is called LDST and FDI. These are the three instructions that interface with memory and, re and uh, registers. So one, uh, load is responsible to go to a location in RAM pointed to by a register, retrieve the content at that location, and then copy that to one of the four registers. That's what LD does. ST, on the other hand, does the reverse, okay? It stores the content of one of the four registers to a location that is pointed to by another register. Well, possibly another register, you can say register. And then LDI is the only instruction that allows you to load a constant into a register. So it is very special in that sense because that is the only way you can initialize a non-zero in a register with a constant that you specified. So we're gonna talk about these instructions today. I suspect I will only have enough time to talk about maybe two of these going through the entire execution cycle. Um, but you know, the lab is gonna help you, help you understand all three of these instructions with the concept of a label as well. So that's what we are gonna do today. We will start with the opcode table because the opcode table tells us you know, it describes uh, the instructions and also, you know, using the RTL, you know, uh, register transfer language, it will also describe, you know, how it is done in the processor, more or less. So we're going to bump up the font size here. And we're going to take a look at the easiest one, which is the LD instruction. This is the LD instruction. The bit pattern is 0, 1, 1, 1, which is a 7 in hexadecimal, and then x, x, y, y. So each individual xx and yy is trying to specify one of the four registers in the register bank. The mnemonic looks like this, LD, and then in parentheses y. The parentheses are not, it is not a syntactic feature in the sense that you know, the parentheses you know, have special meaning. It is more of a notation that I want to remind people that y is the reference, okay? Register y is the one that is being the reference. And then in terms of column C, the description of you know, what this does in RTL, or register transfer language, is that register X gets whatever Y is pointing to in RAM. All right, so I'm using C syntax here, and this is also why CISP360 is a very important prerequisite of this class, because the whole concept of dereferencing a pointer or using something as a pointer 
is field at the end of CIFT 360, and that is what I'm depending on in order to teach this class. And in column B, you know, that, you know, this instruction is simply simply known as load the reference. And all that means <clears throat> is simply to say that, you know, what register Y is the reference, and we get to the location the register Y is pointing to, retrieve the content at that location in RAM, and then copy that to register X. So that's what LD does. Now, of course, you know, in order to use LD properly, Y should be pointing to a location that you intended to point to, okay? So there's no easy way to do that just now because you know, the only way we can point, we can put a value into a register is LDI. So that's why we also have to take a look at row 19, which is the LDI instruction. So now, if you look at the LDI instruction, it looks simpler compared to the LD instruction because it only takes one single register. There's no YY in the bit pattern. So the bit pattern is 0, 1, 1, 0, which is a 6, followed by 1, 1, X, X. So the 1, 1 has to be here, but then the X, X is specifying one of the four registers. The question is, what are we doing with that one single register? The column B now specifies LDI, X, comma, I. So note that the I is not a Y which means it is not one of the four registers. I is representing what we call an immediate value, or from your perspective, you know, because you have C background, it is a constant, basically. So I has to be a constant that is from zero to 255. Um, and then the column C looks very confusing right now, right? Because it looks like um, there are two descriptions here. One is X get. Whatever the program counter is pointing to, post incremented, and you know, whatever it's pointing to, that's what X, the register X is getting. This is the correct description, okay? This actually describes what the instruction does. But if you don't want to have to you know, understand the program counter and all the other stuff, you can also look at it as just X is getting the constant value of I. Okay, so uh, one is describing the mechanism by which the constant I is copy the register X, and then the other one is simply saying, okay, if you don't care about the mechanism, we are just copying the constant I into register X. So that's why there are two explanations separated by a semicolon here in column C. In column D, all that you know, says is load constant value, which is I, you know, right after the opcode. So we're gonna start with this instruction, okay? So we're gonna take a look at how do we load a very specific constant into one of the four registers. And that's going to be the code that we're going to deal with first. So as usual, I can use the assembler to you know, uh, you know, make the instruction. But instead of doing that, I am going to hand assemble the entire thing. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to say, um, let's say we want register C to end up with a value of 17, okay? I don't, I don't exactly know why 17 is the value that I want to load into register C, but that's what we want to do, okay? So looking at row 19 of the opco table, now we want to assemble the instruction, okay? So we have 0, 6, 0, 1, 1, 0, which is a 6. <coughs> So in terms of the opcode, it has to start with a hexadecimal digit of six, but then register C is one zero, okay? The bit pattern one zero describes register C. So the, the most, the least significant portion of the eight byte is going to be one 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 zero here, which is a E, okay? So that means, you know, zero X six, uh, zero X six E or in hexadecimal, 6e is going to specify the opcode. The constant is nowhere in the opcode itself because the constant can be from 0 to 255. It will take 8 bits to represent the constant. The constant is not a part of the opcode. So the way we store the constant that we want to copy to the register is to specify the constant right after the opcode itself. So the constant is going to occupy one byte in RAM right after the opcode itself, 
In this case, it is in hexadecimal one one because you know 17 in decimal is 16 plus one. In base 16, 16 itself is one zero. So you have one left over, which is the one that makes up to 17. So that's why 17 in decimal is known as one one in hexadecimal. So we're doing okay so far in terms of um, how I just hand assembled the instruction. Okay, so I'm going to also specify the mnemonic LDI, load immediate, register C with a constant of 17. So you have to decide for yourself, do you want to hand assemble everything or do you want to use the assembler to translate the mnemonic into the actual binary opcode? Now obviously the answer is the latter, right? Because otherwise why would I write an assembler if I just want the entire class to do hand assembly the entire time. So what we'll do now is we will go to the assembler, which is my spreadsheet over here. <clears throat> and the other thing about you know, the lab is you might want to go through the exercise of going through the lab yourself a few times, you know, just, because, just so that you're familiarized with the process of doing it. So in the source tab, we go to column A and we can clear out the entire column A. And now we type in the new program, which is LDI, oops, LDI, C with a constant of 17. And then we're gonna put a halt instruction here, even though we are not gonna get to the halt instruction because I'm single stepping through the whole thing, but it's just a good idea to have a halt instruction at the end of your code so that when you run the program automatically or using the uh, control K so that it auto clicks the clock, then we'll find a way to stop the entire thing. So the next thing we do is we go to the assemble tab and in the assemble tab, we can see you know, how the instruction or the mnemonic get assembled into the actual byte pattern. So it's difficult for me to use a pointer because you know, when I hover over a cell, it would actually display the comment. So I'm just gonna use my finger to point. Column A is telling us what the mnemonic is and then column W is the address of the first byte on that row, column X and column Y are the two bytes, okay, potentially up to two bytes for that one single instruction. And we can see that, oh, didn't we specify that in the notepad earlier? The 6D is the actual opcode, and then the 1-1 one one is representing the constant that we want to copy to register C. So I'll be making connections you know, between what I just said earlier in class versus you know, what the assembler is now showing you. Yes, hopefully. Any questions at this point? No questions, okay, all right. So we're gonna run this program, okay? We'll run this program in Logisim inside the toy processor and we'll go through the entire process, okay? You'll, we'll go through the fetch, the decode, and then we'll execute the code. But yes, go ahead. Why it is 6E, it has to do with um, how we hand assemble the opcode. So when we go to the opcode table, we can see how you know, the uh, bit pattern here has to be a six followed by a one, one, X, X. But in order to specify register C, X, X has to be one, zero. Register C is one zero, and there's a little lookup here. Register C is one zero if you want, um, so that you can specify you know, XX. Because zero zero specifies A, zero one specifies B, so one zero specifies C, and then one one specifies register D. So does that explain the six E portion? Okay. Um, do you have a question about the one one that is following the six E? Or so that part is okay. The hmm? one one is the constant. It's the seventeen that we want to load into register C. So the quest. So is the question about why do we have a one one after the six E, or is the question why one one is seventeen? Because there are those are two different questions. Why one one is seventeen? Because the one one is in hexadecimal or base sixteen. 
And in base 16, 1, 0 means 16 in base 10. So 1, 0 is 16. We want 17, so we want to add 1 to it, and that becomes 1, 1. Okay? There was a hand somewhere else. Yep, go ahead. This one, takes, it takes two memory spots, but only one of the two spots is the quote-unquote opcode. The other one is really storing the constant that we want to copy to the register C. So like, like when it's in the line, it's on the right side of the list, so it's on the column. Basically. That is correct. The line value. Yep. And then it's not on the two lines. But so, for <coughs> something else that doesn't have, have the next and the Y value, the next row does the, or the intermediate row. Like, okay, so can you go to the experience? So, X and Y, uh -huh. um, that's 0 and 1. But let's say it's just, um, let's say it's just subtract. Okay. And so, uh, okay. So, subtract only uses, the, it's only the opcode. It does not have a second byte yeah. next to it. So it will only occupy column X in the case of a subtract. And then the next one, so that would be zero. And wait, 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 what is going to be zero? Um, the, the, the place on the RAM, or the place on the RAM, the location. To specify which opcode? Subtract. No, subtract is not going to be zero. The opcode of subtract no, no, is not zero. What? There's no address associated with the subtract opcode. So when you look at the opcode table, the subtract opcode is, this is the subtract opcode. So if you look on the position on the RAM, like where the black. Okay, all right. So that depends on where you are putting the subtract instruction. Now, I'm going to do something that really does not make sense. I'm putting an opcode right after the halt instruction. But from the perspective of the assembler, you know, you can still see, you know, how the opcode is put together and where it's going to put it. So I'm going to put a subtract um, BD over here. So we are subtracting uh, register D from register B. Okay. So when we go to the assemble tab, you can see that, you know, the uh, opcode is 97 and it is at location 03 for the subtract BD instruction. Yes, this is location 04, but we have not specified anything to go into location 04. So, yeah, so that's what I mean. So for okay, code, okay. Um, if you look at W, it's incremented by 2, but for subtract, if it subtracted above all, it would only increment by 1 for the uh, row, row W. For column. For column for W, column. right. Mm -hmm. So the way we do the counting mm -hmm. is you. Know, this 0, 0 is referring to the address of the 6E. This 1, 1 is actually location 0, 1. 0, 2, location 0, 2 has a content of 0, 1, which is the opcode of the whole instruction. And then location 0, 3 has a content of 9, 7, which is the opcode of subtract DD. And those are always in column Y. Column Y is always That is correct. Column Y is only used when you specify an opcode that has an immediate constant associated with it. That is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's good observation. All right. So I think we are ready to kind of run this code, okay? Yeah, because we want to know what is happening when we use a LDI instruction. So we are going to start up the logic sim. So we'll do a <coughs> start up logic sim, load the processor in. Okay, there we go. And then the uh, first thing we need to do is to specify the opcode. For simpler programs like the one that we are dealing with right now, you can type it in if you want to, because you know, otherwise, you know, if you're not going to save a whole lot of time. You're just saving it from the assembler to a file and then putting the loading the file into here. But for the sake of going through the process, I'll do that. Okay, so for the sake of illustrating the process. I will you know, basically show you how to download the code from the assembler. So when you are in the assembler, there's one specific tab called RAM file. 
go to that tab, go to that sheet first, okay? And then you go to file, you go to download, you get to CSV, and then it will, you know, my browser is set up to ask me where and what file name to save with. Um, your browser, by default, would just save it with that default name, um, which I do not like, okay? Because I want to be able to name the file that I am downloading. So this is going to be LDI. You know, just I just named the file under which instruction you know I'm trying to demonstrate, and put it into the temp folder. Now it is super important that you download as a CSV file when you are on the RAM file tab. Okay, if you do it from any other tab, it's not going to work. Okay, because only this particular sheet has the proper format that can be read by LogiSim. Okay, so. It is this, this part is really kind of important. So then you go to LogiSim, you go to the RAM file you know, or the RAM component. Remember, it's the RAM component, not the ROM component, okay? Do not overwrite the ROM, okay? So go to the RAM component, go to uh, load image, and then I just specified the full path you know, to, you know, from the temp folder, and this is called LDI.CSV, and now we have the content of the RAM content loaded into the actual RAM and I'm ready to execute the code. So what I'll do next is I'm going to fast forward through the fetch cycle and all, and, you know, I'm, I'll just fast forward through the fetch and decode cycle. Now if you're thinking, but I really want to kind of go through all that stuff again, you know, what is the fetch cycle, you know, what does it do, how does it get it done, and so on. My recommendation is to watch the video from last Thursday or yesterday, because I just went through this discussion in uh, on in the uh, Monday Wednesday class yesterday, so I can go through you know, either one of those videos because you know, I have full detailed explanation in both cases. Okay, so but I'm I I cannot spend the time to repeat that instruction today. All right, so we go to the bottom. You know, let me zoom out a little bit first. So what we do is we are starting with the micro code pointer. Everything starts with the micro code pointer being 0, 0, 0. We are about to have a rising edge. This is the fetch cycle. So control T, and we can see how you know the 6E opcode is now you know fetched into the instruction register. Control T again, we are incrementing the micro code pointer to the next location. And then when we increment, you know, or when I have a rising edge again. The uh, program counter will increment from 0, 0 to 0, 1. You know, this is the program counter right here. It's going to change from 0, 0 to 0, 1, which is the auto increment of the program counter, which can be considered a part of the fetch cycle when we execute instructions. So we talked about all of this last Thursday. Okay, I hope you guys remember all of that stuff. If you don't, that's okay, because I just mentioned where, where you can find the video to re-explain all of this stuff here. Okay, so con control T, this is going to be a rising edge, and the program counter will increment to 0, 1, like so. So at this point, I'm done with the fetch cycle entirely. I went to the location that the program counter points to, get the content at that RAM location, put it into the instruction register, and then auto increment the program counter. So the program counter is no longer pointing to the opcode that I have already fetched. There's no need to continue to point to location zero, zero anymore because I just grabbed the opcode in the fetch cycle. <clears throat> now, in most other instructions, you know, where the program counter points to right now, it's gonna be the opcode, the next opcode, which is not gonna be very important at this point of time. However, because we're dealing with the LDI instruction, where the program counter is pointing to right now is actually important. Because if you go to the RAM component, you can see that the, the program counter is, oh, it's not increment, okay, it's not active yet, so that's why we cannot see it. But if you can see it, the program counter is actually pointing to the byte 1, 1 right now at this point. Now, from the perspective of the program counter, it doesn't know that 1, 1 is not an opcode, it is not the next opcode, it really is the constant that we want to copy to register C. It doesn't know that. The program counter, the processor doesn't know it, okay, at this point of time. It just knows that, oh, the location, location zero, zero, which is the 60, is no longer important to me because, it, I, because I just copied the 60 into the instruction register. 
All right, so we are now going to the decode you know, phase of executing an instruction. And the decode phase is the falling edge where the micro code pointer is getting the content of the instruction register, but with four left shift operation in, uh, incorporated into it. So what that means is 6E is going to be copied to the micro code pointer, but you go like, but wait, hold on a second here. The instruction register is an 8-bit register. The micro code pointer is a 12-bit register. How do you copy 8 bits into 12 bits? What, where are those four extra bits coming in, right? So the answer to that question is the splitter. We explained that last Thursday as well. The splitter is forcing the least significant four bits of the micro code pointer to be a zero while the instruction register content is copied to bit 4 to bit 11 of the micro code pointer. So the micro code pointer will become 6E0. So we talked about this on Thursday, and the lab on Thursday also reinforced this particular concept. All right? So it's not going to help the two people who did not do the lab on Thursday but I hope for the rest of the class, this is going to be helpful. Okay, so let's do a control T, and we can see how the micro code pointer is now 6E0. And 6E0 has its own content in the ROM, and these bits over here, these 26 bits over here, is going to specify the pathways between the components in the processor so that we can actually carry out the LDI instruction at this point. So I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions. No questions? All right. Okay. I'm not a mind reader, so if you do have a question, you know, you have to tell me about it. Hmm? We just decoded. We just decoded. We are about to actually, quote, unquote, execute the instruction. Okay, so the, execute, uh, the execution of the instruction is really just going to the ROM location corresponding to the opcode so that the output of the ROM you know, through the D port is going to configure the multiplexers, the demultiplexers, enabling this register, disabling that register, so it can do all that coordination so that we can actually get the job done. Okay. So now I'm going to have to slow down, okay, because this is new content. This is not something that we have talked about already. So I'm going to slow down and talk about, okay, what, how is the processor configured at this point? Now, the process of analyzing what the processor is about to do is already discussed on last Thursday's you know, discussion. So we are repeating the same process, even though the outcome of the process will be different today compared to what we did on last Thursday. So what we do today, but it's about the same process, okay? We look at all the components that are quote unquote active that can be enabled. So remind me again what can be enabled. <clears throat> or what things are really important in the, in the, in the processor. It starts with a R. There are two things that start with Rs. RAM is good, okay, so RAM is one of those, and then what is the other thing that starts with the R that can be enabled? Registers, very good, okay, so RAM and registers, okay, so we only focus on RAM and registers, and if they're not enabled, we go like, mm, probably not important right now, okay, so we only look at RAM or registers that are enabled. So can someone tell me whether RAM is enabled or not? <clears throat> Okay, first of all, which part, which one is the RAM? Okay, I think most of you are looking at the, in the right direction, I can tell. Okay, so how can we tell whether it is enabled or not? The select, very good. Okay, so the select port of RAM is bright green, which is this one, which means it is selected right now, which means it is active, it is enabled. So that automatically prompts the next question, okay? This is what I want to kind of teach you guys you know, to do. You know, it's not so much it is an assembly language programming concept or a computer architecture concept. It is a question of 
how do you think? Okay, can you auto prompt your own mind with the next question? Okay, and that is a very important technique. It is not something that people are born with. It is something that people train themselves to do. So now you have to ask yourself. Now that we know RAM is selected, what should be the next question? You can. There are a few questions you can ask, but you. Know, so it's up to you. What What is the next question to ask? Is it reading or writing? Is it reading or writing? Very good. Okay. So how do we know whether it is reading or writing? It is the load port. Okay. Now the load port. If it is a one, we are reading from RAM. If the load port is a zero, we are writing to RAM. So right now we know that we are reading from RAM. So we know RAM is being used. We are reading from it, and that should prompt the next two questions. So, what would be one of those two questions that you probably would want to ask right now? Remember, RAM is like a book, right? So you're reading a page from a book. So the question is, which page are we reading, right? Who is determining which page we are reading from? That's one question. Second one is who's reading it? Okay, where is the content of this RAM location being copied to? So those are the two natural questions to ask once we know that RAM is used. It is we are reading it. So the next two questions is who is telling us where to read and who is actually paying attention to the content of that page that we are flipping to? Is that okay? All right. So. Keeping that in mind is important. Okay, it is not so much that okay, this has to do with the RAM and so on and so forth. It is how you prompt yourself with all of these questions. I give you a little clue, and then you just kind of go like, oh, okay. So based on the answer to this question, I want to ask additional questions so that I can figure out more about what is going on with the processor right now. Okay, so let's track down one thing at a time. Who is Uh, controlling which location I'm reading from, that's the job of the A port of RAM. So we have to track down the connection to the A port. It goes all the way to the output of a multiplexer. Is that a dead end? It is not a dead end because we know how to read a multiplexer so that we e- so that even though we know this node ends with the output of a multiplexer, by understanding how the select pin or the select port of the multiplexer is configured. We know which input of the multiplexer connects to the output. It's a bright green, which is a one. So that means input one of the multiplexer is being connected to the output. So now we know what, how to continue with this investigation. So we now know that we have to track down this particular node, and that comes straight out of the program counter. So this is how we can tell that the program counter is telling us. Which location in RAM to read from? Is that okay? The program counter as a register is connected to the A port of RAM, and therefore telling the RAM component which location we want to read from. Is that okay? There's only one question left. Okay, the D port of RAM is now reflecting the content at the location that we're addressing. The question is. Um, who's paying attention? So now we have to track that one down as well. So now we go to the D port, which is an output port for RAM at this point because we are reading from RAM. So we track down this node, and it goes to a lot of places. All right, it goes to a few places that we talked about last Thursday, including the instruction register. Um, but the instruction register is not even enabled. Okay, so it's not going to update. Okay, that's one not the, that's not important. Uh, last Thursday, we also talked about this particular D multiplexer. It's not of no concern to us because the D multiplexer is not even enabled. Okay, so it is of no concern to us. We go all the way to this particular multiplexer, and this particular multiplexer has a select of zero, so it's not even paying attention to the input that is being highlighted right now. So it's of no concern to us. So there's only one more thing. It's going to here, which is one of the input, one of the inputs of this multiplexer. We know the multiplexer is enabled because this pin here 
is, or this port is the enable of the multiplexer. And on top of that, the select of the multiplexer, which is the port right under the gray dot, is a dark green, which is a zero. So we know input zero, which is being highlighted right now, is connected to the output, and the multiplexer is enabled. So now we have to track this one down. Now, this one goes into one of the ports of the register bank, okay? So the question is, uh, what do we do now? We look into the register bank to figure out you know, what is going on at this point. So we right click on the register bank, <clears throat> go to view register bank. So now we look inside the register bank. This port here is the in port from the outside view. So now we, we track down this particular node and go like, okay, where is it going? Well, this is a multi-drop configuration, which means it is going into the D ports of registers A, B, C, and D at the same time. So are we updating all four registers at the same time? We are not, okay? So if we are not updating all four registers at the same time, just visually, can you tell which register is going to be updated on the upcoming rising edge? And how do you make that determination? Register C, but how do you know it is register C? Yep, exactly, it is enabled, okay? Because register C is the only one that has the enable port being a bright green, which is a one. So only register C is really paying attention at all to the clock and also the D port. All of the other registers, A, B, and D, they're going like, you're not talking to me, I am not responding, I'm not doing a single thing. But only register C is, is awakened and go like, okay, I'm listening. Uh, as soon as we have the rising edge, I will update according to the D port. Are we doing okay so far? Yes? Okay, excellent. So um, we just do a control T, okay, control T right now. And we can see how register C is now getting the content of 1, 1 in hexadecimal, which is our 17 in decimal. And therefore, mission accomplished, right? Because that's the objective of the LDI instruction. But wait, there's a little bit more. I forgot to show you the other one. Let's go back to the main, and we take a look at the program counter. It was a zero one. It's a, it's a zero two right now. How did it change? The rising edge changed the program counter as well. Because we can see that even though this is the afterglow of the event, but we can still see that the program counter is enabled, okay? Which means the program counter just updated itself on the rising edge, even though our focus was on register C, the program counter updated at the same time. The question now is, how did the program counter change? Okay, how do we make that determination? We follow the D port of the register. It goes, it comes out of the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select uh, port being a zero, which means input zero is being used to send to the output of the multiplexer. Input zero connects all the way back to the incrementing you know, mechanism. This is the adder. So we are basically also incrementing the program counter so that the program counter changed from zero one to zero two at the same time when register C updated to one one in hexadecimal. Is that okay? All right. So why do we do this? Why do we have to in auto increment the program counter? Because location zero one is not an opcode. It is really just a constant that we have to copy to register C so that when we are preparing for the next fetch cycle, we have to remember to increment the program counter so that we are now actually pointing to the next opcode. That is the significance of the auto increment of the program counter when we execute the LDI instruction. <clears throat> so getting back to the um, spreadsheet here, going back to the opcode table. So this is also why you know, when I describe the LDI instruction, the actual mechanism of the LDI instruction is really this, okay? It is going using the PC, the program counter, to point to a location in RAM, get to that location, copy the content at that location to the register, and after that, this is why it is a post-increment, 
after the copying of the content, increment the program counter itself so that the program counter is once again pointing to the next available opcode in RAM. All right, so that's how LDI works. Do we have any questions about the LDI instruction or how I followed the pathways between the components and how I found out you know, which one is being active and this is why we have to pay attention to the input and the output of that component and then track its way down to the other things in the processor. So just like on Thursday, if you have not done this you know, yourself, you're tracking down the executions of the instruction clock by edge by edge, okay, using control T and try to explain to yourself you know, how everything works, do that, okay? Because it is super important that you do these all of these exercises and do all of these steps and explain to yourself. As you are doing this, you might want to even take notes, okay? So that you can go like control T, okay, let me figure out what is going on here, and then write your own notes. Because the process of writing notes is involving a different part of your brain than you listening to me. So the more pathways you can train your brain to associate with the concept, the more chances you can recall and utilize that piece of information in your mind. Okay, so it is important that you do it yourself because by doing it, that's already establishing a new path in your brain as opposed to just watching me do it. But by documenting it, writing down in your own words, explaining what is going on, that's also going through you know, also additional pathways in your brain, in your mind, to make connections between the concepts. And I'm just going to tell you, this is super important in exam two. And not only that, a thorough understanding of the instructions is a prerequisite of all the topics after exam two, all the way to the end of the semester. So that's why you know we are right now at a really critical moment that you know you have to spend this time, okay? Kind of go through the same thing that I did on Thursday and earlier today to get familiarized with how the processor works with different opcode and instructions. Um, okay, so you guys. Okay, go ahead first. So, like, what a question on our exam? Do you trace out this program and see what's happening? Um, so I would give you. Um, what is equivalent to uh, the ROM code here, but not the ones that we are, that we have here. And then I'll ask you what is the effect of those you know, that, that particular bit pattern on the processor. So what is the processor actually, and what would the processor end up doing based on you know, all those zeros and ones? Okay. And you do that by edge by edge? Um, it would just be a single edge, you know, because it's usually, you know, I won't, ask questions about the fetch or the decode cycle. So by the time I ask the question, it's already clinical executing the instruction. So I would just, I'll be just be asking, okay, so which register is being changed? How is it being changed? How are things connected in the processor? So I will be asking questions in that particular way for the question related to uh, the microcode, you know, because you know, the ROM contains what we call the microcode of instructions. So that's typically a way for me to ask those particular questions. Uh, it still boils down to your ability to track down, you know, I'm not going to give you like, you know, 26 you know, zeros and ones. They would be grouped based on the tunnels already. So I'm going to tell you which tunnel has which particular bit pattern. So that is given to you. Um, it's open book and open notes, which means you can bring a printout of the processor. You can bring in anything you want to. But ultimately, you still have to decode or you have to figure out, oh, if this multiplexer has a select of one zero, and this is, you know, these are the inputs of the multiplexer. We still have to kind of figure out how things are connected because of the values coming out of the ROM. So does that answer the question? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, go ahead. Exam two is going to be about two thirds through the semester. I believe this is week 10. So I'm just done with grading exam one. I apologize for the delay, but October has not been a very kind month to me. Um, not to use it as an excuse, you know, but you know, uh, it is what it is, but it's all done now. Um, so I, I think it's going to be in about one, one week or two, you know, we'll have our exam too. Um, any other questions about this whole process?
So there's no quote unquote material to study on one hand. I'm not going to give you your modules and go like, okay, read these modules because everything is open source. How do you study an open source product? Read the source, right? You know, this is the processor laid out in front of you. You have 100% access to how the processor is designed. You have 100% access to how each component operates. So the only thing left is really to follow the process that I did, which is starting with you know, this micro code pointer being 0, 0, 0. That's the fetch cycle. Start with that, okay? Until you get to the execute portion of an instruction, then you track down how the components of the processor are connected, which one is enabled, how are they connected, and what is going to happen on the rising edge you know, when you execute the instruction. So that's kind of the, the, the way to study the, for this class at this moment. All right. So it's going to take a considerable amount of self-motivation on your part right now because you know, there's no actual step-by-step -step do this and then this and then this and then this and then things are quote unquote kind of optional. You know, I'm not going to give you actual activities to do. So it is really up to you to self-motivate and kind of do the work. All right, so that's one instruction. <clears throat> and the result of that instruction is we put a certain value into register C and you can actually tell what register C has right now. This is register C, it is a one one, which is you know, 17 in decimal. So that's, that's the LDI instruction. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take roll because I have noticed that some people have kind of fallen off the map for the past class or so. So I'm just going to take roll to kind of make sure that people are here. So I just you know make, made it visible, and then the access code is toy. And you have until 10 a.m. to type in toy and then say that you are in class today. So is that okay? It doesn't need, okay, so no problem getting into the activity. Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, so assuming that part is done, we're gonna write some interesting program now. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and touch on a few other things that are also kind of interesting. So we'll get to the assembler, go to the source code here. Now, I would not suggest you know, writing code in the assembler itself in the spreadsheet because you, know, you cannot really delete a line easily or move things around easily. So my usual recommendation is to use some kind of a text editor, just like your know, notepad or mousepad in this case, write your code and then copy and paste it into the source tab of the assembler. That's usually how I would do things. Okay, so we're gonna you know, continue with this program. Um, and then what we do is we are going to introduce a few new concepts. You know, they will be also discussed and explained in today's lab, but I'm just gonna incorporate those you know, in today's lecture also. So we are gonna introduce um, the concept of a label. Okay, so we'll define a label here. So L1 colon makes it the the definition of a label, the colon is what is telling the assembler and say, we are defining label L1 right here. Now the name of a label can be anything, okay? I'm just using L1 because I have no particular uh, description you know, fitting this particular label, so I just call it L1, okay? <clears throat> and then what I do is I can use the byte, you know, um, it's not exactly an instruction, it's called a directive. So byte 45, okay, or 45 in this case, is really just saying, hey, at this location, um, 
give me the 8 bit representing the quantity of 45. Okay, so can someone you know, quickly do the conversion from 45 to base 16 in your head? What you're trying to think of is how do I express 45 as a multiple of 16 plus you know, whatever is left over? It'll be 2D. That was quick. I like that. <laughs> I'll use the calculator. <clears throat> but 2D is indeed correct, okay? Because 45 is 2 times 16, and therefore the 2 of the 16, you know, which is the most significant digit in the two-digit you know, base 16 number. And 2 times 16 is only 32. We're missing 13. The 13 is where the D is coming from. So that's why it is you know, known as 2D in hexadecimal. Okay, but I just described the process, right, you know, of how to do the conversion from base 10 to base 16 is to think about how do I express this particular value as a multiple of 16 plus whatever is left over, okay? So that's the, the, the trick of doing the conversion. You know, you can do that in your head because division by 16 is not too difficult for us to do mentally. Okay, <clears throat> so now I can say, hmm, put the label into register C. So, you know, I know it looks confusing right now in terms of, so what is where again, you know, we'll take a look at the assembler, you know, when we get to that point. But right now, I'm just gonna say, I have an instruction, you know, load the value of the label L1 into register C. And then we'll have, you know, say LDI be with a constant value of, say, three. And then we have an ST instruction to, to basically say store to the location the register C is pointing to and you know, load into that location, overwrite that location in RAM with the value in register B. <clears throat> and then the halt instruction after that. There we go. All right. So from the perspective of the assembler, what is it doing? So the assembler is really just doing line by line and say, okay, what is the opcode corresponding to LDIC with L1? So we know the opcode itself is a 6E, okay, because we just figured that out earlier in today's class. Okay, so the opcode of LDIC blah blah is a 6E, but then the assembler is going to go like, uh, L1, I have no idea where it is, okay, because L1 has not been defined yet at this point of time. But that's okay. The assembler is pretty smart and go like, okay, maybe it will, de it will be defined later. It just makes a note to itself and go like, okay, we have some undefined reference here. We'll try to figure that out later. Then the assembler moves on to the next line and go like, okay, this is another LDI instruction. So it's going to be a six and it's going to be one, one, zero, one this time because we have to specify register B. Register B is zero one, so we have the zero one one zero, which is the six in hexadecimal, and then we have the one one zero one, which I think is a B. No, it has to be a D, right? There you go. So it's a six D followed by a three because the the three is the constant that we want to copy to register B. So the assembler goes like, okay, you know, I just figure out. So all this time, the assembler is also trying to figure out where is the next location. The assembler always starts with location zero, zero. What does that mean? <clears throat> it means this is always at location zero. This is, even though we don't know what this is, we don't know the value, it is going to location one. Okay, and the assembler keeps track of, okay, I have something that I have to figure out later on, but it's going to take up location one. This is taking up location two. This is taking up location three. So the assembler just keeps going, okay? Now we have an ST instruction. I cannot remember the bit pattern of the ST instruction. So go to the opcode table, go look up you know, the ST opcode, which is here, okay? So that's the F ST instruction. Uh, XX, uh, this time you have to be careful because the order is reversed. So XX, which is our register B, is the most significant two bits, and then YY is our register C, which is the least significant two bits. So when you put everything together, we have this is F, okay? So 1111 is always going to be the F. <coughs> and then we have to specify XX first, and in our case, XX is register B, which is a zero, 01, okay? 
And so I have to keep that in my mind right now, or I can just type it out as a zero one. And then the YY is my register C, which is um, one zero, okay? So we have you know, one zero here. This is the um, XX, and this is the YY. So together, zero, one, one, zero is what in hexadecimal? Zero, one, one, zero is what in hexadecimal? Six, okay, very good. So we have a F6 as the opcode, and then we have a halt instruction. The halt instruction has an opcode of zero, one, and then we have a label definition. The label definition does not have a location because a label is a bookmark. So if you think about the RAM location, the entire RAM as a, as a, as a notebook that you're using right now to take notes, okay? Um, then the label is more like a bookmark or a post-it, okay? So that you can remember, oh, that page is kind of important to me. I'm going to put a sticky on that page. But a sticky does not, is not a page by itself. It does not take on a page. All its job, the sticky's job is to say, that page is kind of important. I want to remember you know, that particular page. So that's what a label is. The label itself has no location to it, okay? There's no location associated with it. But the byte 45 or the byte 45 does take up the next location, and the bit, the byte, the bit pattern is going to be the 2D at that location. So right now, I can count the number of bytes in this program, okay? So I'm counting from here. So we have... 6E is location 0, so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? So if I do not use labels, okay, and I want to the program to eventually change this location and change it to uh, a 3 in this case, I could have done all that counting myself and put a 6 here, okay? In other words, I can do all the counting, counting, you know, this is the location that I want to change eventually, but where is it? I can do my own counting. It's like, okay, zero, one, two, three, four, five. This has to be location six, and then backfill this six myself. But that means every time you change your program, you're gonna to have to count again. If your count, if your counting is off by one, it's gonna overwrite the wrong location, and then really bad things will happen. So why do you want to do your own, own counting when the assembler says, hey, all you have to do is to ask me to bookmark that location with a symbolic name, and then you only have to refer to the symbolic name. That is what labels are for. Okay, it is just a handy feature so that when we define a label L1 here, it is basically saying, okay, I am not picking up a location myself, but what location is the next location? What is the next location? So from the perspective of the assembler, by the time it sees the L1 the L1 definition, it goes like, um, uh, what location am I bookmarking? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Ah, I must be bookmarking location six. So L1 as a symbolic name is really the same thing as saying six in this case. Are we doing okay so far? Yep. <clears throat> Say that one more time. If, like if you were to put it in memory instead of using a label, you used six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why would six not be a constant? Why would it not be referred to as a constant? It is a constant. Six being the address is a constant, but what what is at location six can be changed. Okay. So that is the purpose of a label. So now what I'll do is I'm just going to copy and paste this code. Control C, Control A, Control C, go to the assembler, and go to column A. Now, if you don't want to erase the content because your new code is actually longer than your old code, you can always just paste like that, okay? That works too. Um, if your old program is longer than your new program, I would recommend you're just you're, um, deleting the content of uh, column A first before you paste, just so they don't have any leftover code from before. So. The next question is, do you think I assembled this program correctly? Oh, by the way, I forgot one thing. 
because now we know L label L1 is really just a six. So that means you know this second byte of the entire program is really just a six. Or so I think it is. So let's go check it out, okay? Because you know, I just hand assembled a program and I want to check to see if this is actually the output. So we go to the assemble tab. Unfortunately, I cannot show both at the same time, but you can probably remember most of it. So uh, LDIC with L1 translates to a 6D followed by a 06, okay? LDID with a 3 is a 6D followed by a 03, okay? So far so good. Um, FTCD is a F6. I think that was uh, our conclusion as well, okay? Because zero one and then one zero is a six. The fault is a zero one, we know that too. And then 45 in decimal is 2D in hexadecimal. We figure that out, right? You know, we, you, know, you use a calculator, but I explained, you know, why that is the case. So in other words, I just hand assembled the entire program and the assembler agrees with you know, how the program should be assembled. Is that okay so far? All right. So the next question is, uh, but what is this program actually going to do? Okay, so that has to go back to the RTL description or the register transfer language description of the opcode or the instructions. Okay, so we'll get back to that part here in just a little bit. But I do want to show you, you know, what L1 does, okay? So L1, even though here it doesn't say anything about how L1 is defined, you can cheat a little bit and go to um, the last tab, you know, um, on, in the assembler. It's called a symbol table. I know it's not easy to read because this is actually a JSON representation. But you can actually sort of work it out and see that L1 is defined on line six. And RTN is actually telling you the actual value corresponding to that label, and it really is also six. So it is defined on line six, but the value of the label is also six. So this is one kind of quirky way, I would have to say it's quirky, but it's a quirky way to basically know how the labels are defined if they're multiple, where are the definition of the labels and what how the label is actually defined? What is the value corresponding to the label? Now remember this is JSON, JSON or the JavaScript object notation. So for those of you who do not like to read it because it has no indentation and whatsoever, you can go to a website that can what we call pretty print, you know, JSON. <clears throat> and then just you know, paste it in here. And it will show you a much nicer format on the other side. So this is a quick and easy way to you know, copy and paste um, a kind of cryptic you know, JSON representation and use the other side to go like, oh, okay. So L1 is a label. It is defined on line six. The value of that is actually six. It is also corresponding to the address of six and so on. So when you have a lot of label definitions and you go like, oh, okay, I have no idea how they're defined. This is a quick and easy way to do that. Okay, so if you're not interested in how the assembler works in the inside, I guess you don't have to do this, okay? But, you know, I always like to figure out how things work, okay? Not just you know, what it does, but how does it get it done? So this is how you can figure that part out. All right, so getting back to what the program is actually going to do. So what we'll do is we are going to use the RTL description to try to figure that out. So I'm going to use the second portion of this program in all comments to try to figure out what this program is actually going to do. So the first thing it's doing is to say, okay, let's change register C to L1. And then it says, you know, let's change register B to a three. And in the ST instruction, now, yes, this is a new instruction to us, but all we have to do is to go to the uh, opcode table Go to the ST instruction, and it says, let's dereference Y, okay, and store whatever register X to wherever Y is pointing to, okay? So we're going to use the same notation in our description here. So we are using uh, register C, so that is what we are doing <clears throat> with the ST instruction, and then it's going to halt, okay? So the halt instruction it's basically just saying, okay, we got nothing else to do now. Just keep yourself stuck in the loop. That's all it's saying. 
Okay? So now the question is, what are we exactly doing in this program? Okay? So all you have to do is to track down the values of the registers, right? So you basically go like, by the time we get to, you know, uh, the reference B equals to B, what we are really doing, because we know what is in register C now, register C has the value of label L1, and the register B now has the value of 3. Is that okay? Does everybody see how I just converted the register transfer, you know, description into a description that actually makes use of constants and values? That has to do with what value did we put into the registers. I intentionally put L1 into register C. I intentionally put 3 into register B. So when I say, you know, asterisk C equals to B, it really is the same thing as the reference L1, and the right-hand side of the um, equality becomes a 3. What does that mean? What is L1? Well, according to what we saw earlier, L1 is really just a symbolic name of 6. So all we are really doing is doing that. But what is the effect of doing that? So this boils down to C concept, right? So what do we end up doing? <clears throat> it depends on how well you remember the asterisk uh, operator, which is also called the reference. So can someone, yep? That's it. Okay, that is correct. So this is this ends up changing the notation six in RAM to a value of three from whatever it was before. Now, do we know what it was before? Yeah, we do. It's, it was forty-five in decimal or two D in de hexadecimal. So that's going to be changed. Is that okay? All right. Cool. I'm looking at the time. Okay. So the question now is, how do we know this program you know, is doing exactly that? Okay, so there are several ways to do this. One way is to use Control T. So basically, you know, you just do Control T a whole lot of times, and then you keep an eye on the value of the registers, and you keep an eye on the content in RAM as you do the Control T. So that's one way to do it. Um, the first time you do something like this, you know, from your perspective, I would recommend actually doing it once, okay, you know, just to kind of get used to the process. But once you get used to this, you go like, okay, that's way too time consuming. Can I do this in a faster way? The answer is yes, and there are multiple ways to do it in a faster way. The first time, you know, the first thing you can do in a faster way is really just to run the program until you get to the halt instruction, and then you inspect the content of RAM to make sure that location six is indeed changed from a 2D, which is what the program is going to load into that location, to a 3 after the program finishes its execution. So we, let's do that first. Okay, so we'll do that first. <coughs> Excuse me. And by the way, you know, um, well, okay, we'll, we'll just kind of keep it simple like that first. So control C, control A, control C, go to the assembler, and then go to the first line, control V. I mean, you know, I really did not change anything because everything that starts with a slash rest is a comment. It doesn't really do anything. So when I go to the RAM file tab, the program really hasn't changed much, okay? So we go to file, and then we go download CSV, and we'll call this one, you know, um, we are really testing the ST instruction in this case. So I'm, not, I'm gonna call this program ST.CSV. <clears throat> switch to the processor. So now you have a choice, okay? So the typical way that I would recommend people to do is to go to simulate and then reset simulation. So every time you want to start the execution of a new program, go ahead and reset simulation. So what that would do is it will change the clock all the way back to a low, a zero, and it will also clear out the content of RAM. So now you can go to RAM, load image, and then specify this is the st.csv file, and we have a new program in. So first thing first, we want to go to location 6 and make sure that location 6 is our 
45 or 2D, right? So we just do the counting here. This is location zero, this is location four. How do we know? Because zero four is on the left edge on this row. So the first byte or the leftmost byte of the row has the address of zero four. This is zero five, this is zero six. Indeed, it is a 2D, okay? So we double check everything. Then you use the control K feature, okay, to basically start your execution, or you can go to the menu and then you say you'll tick enabled, but you might want to change your tick frequency to like 4.1 kilohertz, just that it, it gets it done really fast. So now we enable the ticks, and the way you can tell that the program is done is to look at the halt pin, okay? If the halt output pin is a one, that means the program has reached a point where it's not gonna change any further. Type control K again to stop the simulation. So now we go back to the RAM, and then we can see that the same location, 06, is now a, well, the location 06, which had 2C, 2D, is now a 03. So the program did exactly what we thought it should do. So this is a quick and easy way to do it, okay? So if I say there's a quick and easy way to do it, I'm implying there is a slower but more detailed way to do this, okay? Which I think is actually more beneficial from your perspective to be able to see how the program changes the registers line by line, instruction by instruction. Okay, so we're gonna do it the other way now. <clears throat> so to do it the other way, you have to kind of get out of the GUI mode. So we get out of the GUI mode and then we switch to the command line mode. Okay, so if you remember how to do all the command line stuff from before, a lot of that skill is still going to be applicable now. Um, if you have not done the command line stuff, you know, to verify the output of your circuits from earlier parts of the class, this may be a good time to learn how to do this, okay? So we're going to do the Java dash jar, okay? Go locate logic sim itself. So this is all. Now, how you do this part really depends on where you put the files and also which operating system you're using. If you're using a Mac OS type of operating system or Linux, the command line will resemble something like this, okay, using the forward slash and all that stuff. If you're using Windows, then it's gonna be the other ways, which you kind of have to learn by yourself how to work with the command line interface. Um, then we have to load the processor, so that's a long path from here to, because of the way I put my you know, files. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so then the next thing you have to do is to specify what do we want to load into RAM. So that can be done by using the dash load, uh, what we call a switch, and then you specify where we can find the CSV file that we downloaded from the assembler. I believe this is st.csv. So if you do all this part here and press the enter key, it will still be going into the GUI mode, except RAM is now preloaded with the content that we specified here. Okay, let's double check, okay, just to make sure this command works the way we are supposed, oh, okay. I guess we cannot do it this way because we have to use dash tty, so dash tty and then table. Okay, so now the program will automatically execute and you know it's going to track the ch the red chain the registers the program counter and all that stuff into something that looks like this, okay. And even I cannot tell you what's going on, okay, by looking at all the zeros and ones. So the int the intention is not to read all these zeros and ones by yourself. So the intention is to capture the output using the redirect symbol here. This works in Windows as well, okay. And redirect everything to a file. I'm going to put it into st.tsv. <clears throat> now, this part is important. TSV stands for tab separated value, which is not the same as a comma separated value file, a CSV. So when you capture the output of the execution of a program, you should name that file with the TSV extension and not the CSV extension. So it would appear that nothing happens because the output is now in the st.tsv file, and I can take a look at that file just to be sure, right? So we go to temp dot uh, backslash st.tsv, and here we go, okay? So we, we captured a bunch of zeros and ones you know, like we're supposed to. 
Now, I forgot one thing. I do apologize. I forgot one really important thing. Uh, the one thing that I forgot is, you know, you actually need to start with a no op instruction if you use this technique, which this program did not have. So I have to change the program a little bit here because I do have to start with a no op instruction. So now we go to the RAM file again and we download the thing. The, the, the necessity of the no op instruction has to do with a bug in um, Logisim. So you know, because of that bug, you have to start with a no op instruction. Okay, there we go. So now we go back here and just redo the entire thing. And I think we should end up with a file that's longer. Now, now that looks more normal. Okay, that's good. Okay, so now that we have the TSV file, what are we going to do? We re-upload the TSV file back into one of the sheets of the assembler. <clears throat> so we switch back to the assembler. We go to the trace raw data tab. Okay, so it has to be this particular tab. You go to file. You go to import. Now, you have to pay close attention and at this point you have to go to upload click browse and we want to upload st.tsv okay not csv csv is the content of ram tsv is the actual trace of the execution so pick that file it's going to upload it now here comes the super important part because you have to change from create new spreadsheet to replace current sheet, okay? And you have to be on trace raw data sheet when you do this. Uh, turn off detect automatically and just say tap because we know for sure this is a tap separated value file. And then turn off convert text to numbers, dates, and formulae. Okay, you have to turn that one off. And then click import data. It's gonna take a little bit of time, okay? So now we have the data uploaded back into one of the sheets of the assembler. You go like, okay, so that's a lot of steps. What is it buying me? What it is buying you is now you can look at the analysis tab and it can break down the operation. It basically says at location zero, zero, we execute the opcode of no op and then nothing happened. And then when we get to location zero, one, well, why is it not locating the the opcode and the line number. Okay, so I, I'm guessing this tool does not, you know, doing it this way does not show that, but it still shows some other things. It shows that, you know, uh, register C got updated to a 07. Now, why is it 07 not, and not 06 this time? What did I change to the program? I inserted a no op as the first opcode. So everything got bumped down a little bit by one byte. So what was location 06 is now location 07. Uh, register B is still updated to a 3. And then location 7 is now changed to a content of 3. So, red, so column C is telling you how RAM locations are changed. Column D is telling you how registers are changed. Column A is telling you the location of the opcode that we're executing. <clears throat> so this is a different tool, okay? It doesn't just give you the final result of location seven got changed to a three, but it also shows you how we got there along the way with changes to the registers themselves. So this can be very helpful. I'm looking at the time, we still got two more minutes, which is excellent because you know, I can now show you a third tool to do this. You guys go like, Okay, I kind of like the first way better because it's easy. I know how, how to do it exactly. The second way is a lot of steps, okay? I do not particularly like this step here. So let me show you the third way to do this. The third way to do this is to use the tool that I called Ripper Spider. So let me go to um, that folder, okay? And then it has a command called submit. And then what you do is you write your code first, okay? So I'm gonna have to write the code. I never store that code back in here. So it's st.tsv, oh, no, tttasm. <clears throat> and I can just kind of copy and pa paste the code. No op, LDI, C with seven, uh, with uh, L1, LDI, B with three, ST, CB, uh, the whole construction here. 
label L1 is defined over here, and then we have um, byte uh, 45. So I, I basically ignored all the comments, you know, I just kind of put in the program itself. And you might notice that I, my editor also has syntax highlighting for the assembly language that we are using. So if you're interested in getting this particular editor and all the syntax highlighting features, I can talk about that too. Most people don't care. Okay, so now this is the magic moment because you know, instead of doing all the other stuff, you'll know, hand manually one by one step at a time and then copy, paste, specify this when we import, blah, blah, blah. All you have to do now is to say submit uh, temps st.ttpasm, press the enter key and just sit back and let the script gets its job done. Okay, so it might take a little bit of time, okay? So it says right here, submitting the, the source code to the assembler. Assembler is finished, validating the object code. Object code is good, starting the simulator. It actually starts logicin by itself <clears throat> and log the output of logicin. Simulation finished, submitting trace data. It submits the trace data all the way back to the spreadsheet. Trace data, trace data uploaded, check the analysis sheet. So with that, we switch back to the spreadsheet here, and now it looks super clean, right? And it even shows you which line corresponds to the execution you know, where in RAM and what's happening. So when we said, you know, LDIC with an L1, register C got changed to seven. When we said LDI B3, register B got changed to a three. When we do the ST instruction, you can see location seven of RAM is changed to a zero seven, zero three. And then we get to the halt instruction, that's the end of the entire program. Okay, so we can talk about how to get um, this tool to work, you know, Ripper Spider. Um, my original one was only for myself to use, so it only ran in Linux. <clears throat> one of the students from a previous class, Omer, Omar, um, he rewrote that script to run in PowerShell. So you can install PowerShell for free in Windows and then use his script to do exactly the same thing. But there are quite a few steps to set up the assembler to work with you know, the script, but it is all documented, okay? So you can go ahead in the class, there are links to do it already. So if you go to the modules and just look for, I'm just gonna do a control F search for River Spider. There we go. So the zip file is gonna work for uh, Linux type system and uh, Mac OS should work as well. And then you know, if you're using Windows, you, know, you can use Omer's uh, uh, port for PowerShell. But in either case, there are things that you have to configure first, okay? Um, if you want to use the computers in the lab here and you know, use you know, the PowerShell approach, I would suspect that you want to put everything on a thumb drive so that every time you come here, you do a lab, you just you know, stick your thumb drive in, and then all the tools are on the thumb drive itself. But if you have your own computer, you're bringing your own device, then obviously you can just you know, kind of keep everything on your local hard drive. So um, really nifty tool. You know, I really like using it because it saves me a lot of a lot of you know, time. But you know, it does take some time to kind of set it up, and you know, the documentation is inside the zip file itself, okay? So it will actually tell you how to do it. I can go through that process maybe next time, you know, in the next class. Um, but right now, you know, we, are, we don't really have to use it right now. It's just a nifty tool that once you get used to it, it can really help to shorten the amount of time that it takes to run the program and to visualize what's happening while the program is running. All right, so that's the end of today's lecture. Everything is being recorded. The screen is still good. The audio is still good. So I'm going to upload it. Um, you have your lab for today. And the lab for today is <clears throat> uh, LDST and LDI. I'm going to make it visible to you. So now it is visible. And there's an access code also. The access code is just LDI itself. So I'm going to write it on the whiteboard, L-D-I is the access code. And are there any other questions before I stop the recorder? We good? Okay, all right. So I'm going to stop the recorder and upload the recording on YouTube.